Um, good afternoon, and thank you to Lorna and Alison for the opportunity to talk to you today. And also thank you very much to the previous speakers. Those of you who were here this morning, there were some very um, candid conversations about personal experiences of failure and challenges, which I think were hugely beneficial. Um, this session appealed to me on many levels, and I could have written any number of talks about various failings from virtually every aspect of my archaeological life, but um, I chose today to present a paper looking at a climate change interest which is currently occupying a lot of my time at work with my colleague Mer Meredith Wiggins. We work in the research bit of Historic England. Um, for those of you that aren't from England perhaps or um, aren't familiar, Historic England is the public body that looks after England's heritage, that's our strap line. Um, we perform statutory functions of advising on designated heritage assets and advising government on matters concerning heritage. That's one of our primary roles. Um, and Meredith and I focus a lot of our work on thinking about climate change as challenge and opportunity for heritage. So this this first really depressing slide. Um, I was hoping there used to be this brilliant um, NASA time lag thing, but I couldn't quite get it to, to work. So you've got the before and after photos here. And when I first brought this up on my screen, I've seen this before, so I, I know this inside out. This is the carbon dioxide concentrations from September 2002. Um, I first looked at that and I thought, oh, there's no colour on that. That's that. I, I, I need to run the thing. No, this is just the dramatic change that you see to September 2016. That's 14 years in the 21st century of increasing concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And if you play this through, it's absolutely terrifying. It builds and builds and builds until the whole thing becomes orange. And they've got similar um, little time lag things for um, temperature, I think for sea temperature, for, for a whole, whole load of, of measurements, um, which um, are, are quite dramatic. So um, climate change, I was thinking about it. Climate change is basically the ultimate symptom of our success. We've been so successful as a species that we have totally managed to take control of so many aspects of our life. But the upshot of that is that we have also made fundamental changes to the world. We're now well into the Anthropocene. This, these are changes that are of a scale and a rate that have not been seen before. <coughs> um, and I quite like this. I was looking for one of those kind of Ascent of Man things. There's 101 versions out there from playing golf to being sat at the computer. But this one, anyone that saw Blue Planet the other weekend and the incredibly depressing representations, the amount of plastic that you're getting in corners of the world where people aren't even living. Um, so we've got this, this kind of balance between climate change as, as being the result of this amazing technological process um, that has got us to, to where we are today with all sorts of benefits but also created the ultimate failure in, in our um, abilities of species to create scenarios which are going to make certain parts of the world uninhabitable for us, which is quite an extraordinary balance. Um, and I was thinking that in some ways it's um, very similar to the, it's another kind of paraphrasing of Churchill, like the session. So it's an undergraduate essay that I was set at one point about our building shaping us and us, um, us shaping our buildings, building shaping us. And this is in many ways, um, the situation with climate change, our behaviour is shaping um, the world and in return we are going to have to shape our behaviour to respond to some of these changes. So just if you weren't depressed enough at the features of where we are with commercial archaeology and uh, changing climate. So this, this black line here um, represents, uh, so this is two degrees, there's a lot that's, that's talked about in terms of climate change success, what that might look like limiting this climate change to two degrees that's kind of banded around as if that's a thing that's the marker of success in order to achieve that this is what this, this black line is depicting and this is from from DEFRA's um, 2009 <coughs> report emissions had to peak in 2016 and then reduce every year by 4 percent <coughs> now that ain't really happening um, so it's generally accepted that the idea that we might be able to restrict climate change to two degrees of global um, temperature, average temperature um, increase, it's not really that realistic. This green line is the low emissions scenario from the <coughs> Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So that's kind of heading, so this is 2091, so 75 years away, a bit less, um, that's three degrees. 
median, that's kind of, kind of the average scenario, four degrees. I mean, goodness knows, this, this high scenario is heading up to six degrees of warming. By 2050, in that, that scenario, we're heading up to three degrees. So these are, these are changes that are beyond, are beyond what a lot of the, the conversations that are happening, certainly in the political sphere, are, are really prepared to talk about. Um, so we, we know in, in climate change terms what, what success would look like. We also know that we're gearing up to fail for that. So these are, these are impacts that even at a two degree global increase, we're looking at fundamental changes in um, predictability of weather patterns. Precipitation in particular, and in, in the UK, this is one of the things that actually keeps me awake at night. It's not necessarily because things are getting warmer, it's not because um, drought and those sorts of things, it's actually, we're going to have hugely more intense rainfall. And that rainfall poses huge problems for, particularly for our buildings. How many of you think gutters overflowing, running down the side of a building? Our gutters are designed for certain amounts of rain. When those start to fail, you get very wet walls, this causes all sorts of other problems. Maintenance, <coughs> Neil might touch on this later on. Um, He's got a, one of my favourite drain pipe pictures of all time, which I didn't steal. But these, these are the sorts of challenges that we aren't necessarily thinking about. Also increases erosion for archaeological sites. Um, very sodden ground is more likely to cause cliff collapse around the coast as well. We know that sea level um, is rising. We know that there's likely to be increase in storminess, which is going to increase uh, patterns of erosion and coastal change, um, inundation around the coast and increases in temperature at land and, land and sea, extremes of wetting and drying, and invasive pests and diseases. So we've got some like the clothes moths down here. There was a recent report, um, I think it was a National Trust report, on, on increases that they're already observing in, in moths and other pests in some of the collections. Um, and these are some personal documents <coughs> damaged in, um, in flooding. Um, so this is affecting people, their things, places, um, wholesale. And in certain parts of the world, so thinking back to the recent um, storm Ophelia and the impact in uh, the Caribbean, some of those islands were described as, as uninhabitable islands, <coughs> and we're gonna see increases in that sort of storminess. And certain Pacific islands where they're very, very close to sea level, we're looking at potentially the whole scale loss of people's homes and places, and quite radical changes. So, when you're actually facing up to that, so how do we, what's, what's success going to look like in that phase? So we, we're going to try and avoid becoming Kevin Costner in Waltz World. Um, I don't, yeah, the, the frozen waste. I mean, there's endless disaster movies that, that tell us what happens when things go wrong. So are we basically just talking about trying to survive as a, as a species. Is that, is that success, just the human race still being here? Or is success about trying to maintain a certain familiarity in a way of life? some kind of continuity or is it realistic is it possible to think of success as being trying to reverse eventually in some time frame reverse some of these environmental changes um, and then again so what what does that mean for heritage if heritage is this link between the pe people <coughs> their places their things what does this sort of potential catastrophic future um, mean when you're starting to think about these things so I think it's already been mentioned, preservation in situ, heritage success is uh, generally has been um, in this country about preserving things. The principles of preservation in situ are run quite uh, deep in a lot of the work that what we do. Yet we know from the um, Fading Star project, work at Star Car, for instance, that changes in the depositional context of these waterlogged sites is affecting the material culture that's preserved. So um, the famous um, antler front that um, excavated what, 50, 60 years ago, prior to the, the um, most recent excavations where they got these jelly bones, where the, the mineral composition of the, of the very bones has changed so much that they're actually not really bones anymore that's in the old bristle and rigid and retain those properties. Now that's from changing um, land management, but similar things will be happening as groundwater shifts in um, our other, many other um, culturally significant wetland deposits. Um, so 
if, if preservation is going to be very challenging, um, and that's even in places that aren't falling off cliffs and being eroded or inundated um, and, and, and lost forever, is it about retaining some kind of relevance, some kind of connection? Um, is it about being able to reuse these places? But all of these approaches are about tangible survival, a tangible heritage in some way or other. And what happens when actually, in some communities, we're going to be looking at such wholesale loss of, of things and of these places and of that tangible heritage? Are there other elements that we need to start thinking about and being a little bit more open to? So, what role can heritage play in these in these um, conversations? Now, I think there's quite a lot. I spent um, a lot of my time being really positive because I think heritage is really great, uh, has a really great comp contribution to make to climate change. So, one of them, we are really familiar with really long time frames. We know how things change and how people have responded through time to challenges. Okay, what we're facing in the future is unlike anything that's happened in the past, but there are elements of it that we can learn from. Um, this is my youngest um, hominin exploring the Cromer forest beds um, on a busman's holiday this summer. <coughs> We've got a million years worth of history in Britain that we can use to bring to bear on understanding the time frames, the interaction that people have with places. Um, and that's very helpful when you're trying to think long term into the future. I would argue that as someone who spends a lot of their time thinking millions of years into the past, um, I'm better equipped to think that kind of time frame in the future than to perhaps um, maybe some of my <coughs> natural environment colleagues who I try and talk to about these things who are thinking in terms of patterns where they've been collecting data for maybe 50, 60 years. The other thing that we can do is, is perhaps look at ways that we can learn from the past, as well as contextualising these changes. One interesting way in which you can do that um, is by thinking of those records, this, so soils for instance, if you think of those as a cultural artefact, what they can tell us about that past behaviour, particularly soils that are a result of, of agricultural practice, changes in agricultural practice, changes in land use. Um, we've got markers and long longevity within that that can illustrate the impacts of different decisions within a landscape and different processes um, that can take us on on a journey that actually is beyond perhaps uh, a single human lifetime that we might be trying to think into the future and that can be helpful there aren't many other disciplines that can do that so i think there's an awful lot we can do but <coughs> Are these things still slightly missing the point? So if, if the heritage, if the real point about heritage, and this did come up this morning, was about, it's about people, it's about people and their places and their things, do we need to also start to go back to right to the basics about what, what makes these things valuable and important? And do we need to start actually listening? Now, I'm not sure we're very good at this. Um, I've spent most of my career in local government um, firefighting probably um but one thing that i learned is and i think came up again this morning is that people are passionate about heritage in different pla in different and often unexpected places but as professionals and in terms of the structures within which we work i don't think we're always very good at listening and at taking that forward and building new ways and new ways of approaching that so we need to understand what people value now, i hope this is going to work if not i'm going to have to try and um, paraphrase, but this is a project uh, that uh, we undertook this summer. Had a, an anthropology PhD student, PhD student come and work with me for six months. It's an excellent opportunity. She's um, from Brazil and spent most of her time researching in the Amazon rainforest. And she went off to um, a community that's been severely affected by coastal change. Uh, one of the things I was interested in was how did the people in that place feel about their environment, feel about the change, I feel about heritage. What was, was there any relationship between the two? Um, and I was interested in whether or not doing this, approaching this in a very ethnographic way, so not making assumptions about what they were going to tell us, not coming with pre-prepared questionnaires and taking the time to listen, whether that would tell us something uh, different. Now, if this works, it would be great. Um, if it doesn't, we should see. Well, the big thing I think about this area is the church towns. Mm -hmm. They, 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 from the top of the dunes, you can see some of the church towers. Yeah, unchanged. 
I think because it is so um, so peaceful and so quiet and so totally unchanged, and you get the feeling that generations of people um, going back hundreds and hundreds of years have walked in the same place, mm -hmm. and um, it is it is unchanged. I think you get a wonderful feeling of people who've been here, mm -hmm. um, and um, it's very unspoiled. Mm -hmm. um, and you are very much part of nature. So this is a place that has lost, well, let's put it this way. I, I visited this site about seven, seven years previously. And the bottom of the steps that I'd walked to get down from the caravan part onto the beach um, were now, seven years later, probably about 15 metres from the line of the cliff. This, the, the coastline there is eroding at a rate of knots. Um, the caravan park is now, I think it's reduced to one line of caravans. And yet what people repeatedly said that they value about this place is the lack of change, the mm -hmm. fact that nothing changed. So in my head, I'm going in there thinking, oh, I want to ask, I want to understand what people's relationship is with change and with heritage within that. Are they worried about things going over the edge of the cliff? Are they, and actually what they're describing is that sense of continuity and timelessness of a landscape that I think is characterised by change with my sort of geological background <laughs> heading. So I think it's really interesting. We've got to be really careful about some of those assumptions that you might make about what are valuable for people. But that presents its own... The, the other big thing... Oh, sorry. <laughs> but at the same time, when preservation of these unchangeable features is totally unrealistic, how do we reconcile that? So we've got people saying what they value about this place is it doesn't change, it's that continuity, it's the interconnectivity of the, the church towers, that sense of, of time depth. But when we can't do anything about maintaining that, are we then failing the people that are valuing that? Um, and that sense of um, helplessness. So I've, I've heard the guys that run the SCAPE project up in Scotland, um, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's a community project recording coastal heritage. It's a brilliant, brilliant example of community engagement. Um, but I've, I've heard um, Tom and, and Joe run the project talking about how the, that helplessness of communities and the frustration, because originally they were just going around recording and observe, almost observing the decay of stuff. And I think that there's a moment the penny dropped, um, as I understood it when they were describing this, when they suddenly realised that actually it's really frustrating. Someone said, yeah, could you just go and take some photos of that as it gradually falls into the sea? That'd be really helpful. I'm thinking, hang on a minute, I don't want to watch this fully. That's, that's really depressing. Um, so one approach that they then had taken was in, in giving, empowering people, giving people a sense that they could just be doing something. They want to be doing something in order to engage with that. Um, because otherwise, if you disengage, if you dishearten people too much, they disengage with heritage. They, they, we lo then lose that connection, that interest that people have, and that connection between the past and the present. And people, well, what's the point? <coughs> what's the point? Which would be really sad. So one of the this is a fairly recent example that's come out of I think it's, a, it's come out of the um, the skate project that a colleague showed me just just yesterday. So this is Weems Cave in uh, Scotland. And they've laser scanned it, so it's got Pictish carvings inside it. Now, I think this is really exciting because what's happened is they've, they've done something, doesn't it? Really constructive. Now, ironically, this is using the pinnacle of modern technology, so this is the end point of that miserable industrial revolution journey that brings us where we are with the climate change in the first place. But silver cloud, silver linings and clouds. And, um, but what also this has done, this is online, anyone can go and explore this. Now, I probably would never have known about this cave. I probably would never have visited it. There's probably a handful of people each year that would. But this is now able to reach much wider audiences and engage many more people. So that process of empowering and engaging people at local levels has got all these other benefits that come with it, which I think is quite an interesting spin-off. Now, heading another slight tangent, but bear with me, we might end up um, together. So Marcy Rotman, um, a colleague and friend of ours in the, in the US, who's done an awful lot of work on climate change in the National Park Service. She deserves a lot of our sympathy at the moment, given the context in which she's <laughs> working in a Trump administration. But um, she has this wonderful um, think piece that she's done about a cultural suitcase, she calls it. So this is the, the burning building situation, and you can take a handful of things with you. 
what do people choose to take? So this is an example from um, a Tumblr thread where there's some conversation about this. What do you take out of your burden buildings? This is a 19-year-old taking a cuddly toy, necklace with a map of Texas and a phone. Um, but repeatedly what you find, and think about yourself, think about what you would take from your home, the things that you would most want to, to treasure and take with you. It's, it's the personal effects. It's not necessarily the valuable stuff. It's the things that trigger memories, the photos, the heirlooms, the memorabilia, and perhaps maybe some, you know, your phone, because that's probably got all of that on it at the moment. <laughs> um, but it's, it's those sorts of things. Um, and that tells us something about people's relationship with, with heritage. Um, and so as a national heritage organisation, we can, we can probably work with that, build on that. That tells us something about how, to, how people are engaging and what they're valuing. So putting all that together and revisiting what we in Historic England and what other organisations can do to work with this failure of climate change, there are a lot of opportunities. We can share our expertise. We can share our long-term understanding of change. We can help people understand the evolution of places through time, people's relationship with that. <coughs> but I think we can also start to recognise the intangible and we can recognise the importance of the everyday heritage in what we do. And more importantly, I think one of the things that we have to do as professionals is to use our expertise, to share that expertise, to empower people, to conserve and preserve those things that they care about and also support them in telling us about those things. So I did have another clip, but I think it's a bit long, so I might leave it. Um, so I think learning from the past, I've, I've written more about this elsewhere. These are two, so good, the, the studying history, doomed to repeat it. I think we know enough about history to know that people don't learn from history, let's face it, but I'm not sure that that is necessarily important. I think what we can do is use it to conceptualise changes. So Somerset Levels, this is one of my most favourite photos. I use this on the front cover of our climate change adaptation plan. It's Eastling and, I'll probably pronounce it totally wrong, Eastling and Athenley in um, Somerset. So um, these are places, the Somerset Levels, it's basically a bog land. It's, anyone that's seen, is it Last Kingdom, the thing where um, the Vikings and Alfred's hanging out in the bog and anyway, there's a lot of scenes of wading around marshes and stuff. That's, that's what Somerset should really look like until we came along and drained it all. Um, but this is it under flood. The landscape's trying to return to what it would be like if we hadn't dug loads of ditches and tried to drain it over years. And what's really great is it's the burr and the monastic complex that are sitting proud above the flood water because that's the landscape that was where those settlements were, were first um, created. So we can use that to help to explain to people as they find it increasingly challenging to farm that landscape and to <coughs> deal with increased rainfall and flood risk. That actually, in, if you take the long view, it's not overly surprising. But finally, I think one of the exciting things for me, um, and I think Neil's gonna touch on the creative opportunities of this um, in his talk in a little bit, but when we start to listen to people about the heritage, the things that they value, the things that are important to them, and we open ourselves up to listen, we can discover all these other um, values and heritage and stories that we wouldn't otherwise know about. And one of my favourite projects um, with Historic England is the LGBTQ Heritage Project, the Pride of Place, which was suddenly recognising all these buildings and places that meant something to communities who previously had never shared or spoken up about those and really being able to celebrate them and giving those communities the confidence to raise those and promote those and, and to celebrate them as well. So I guess the, the final message of hope is that actually if we start to, to listen, um, then we might discover new ways and new um, opportunities for sharing heritage and building new ways of, of presenting and promoting that, which should and could um, be far more inclusive than they have been to date. Thank you.